Okay, um, before I start to talk about uh, the topic I really want to talk about today, I want to wrap up the, the issue or the interesting uh, situation uh, last Friday when we saw under a copy constructor. Do you remember we had that interesting case? It's copy constructor, we can actually access the private member of another object. So um, this is something which is uh, um, I was not aware of, and then I did some research. I realized that uh, there is two kinds. Well, when we talk about private member assets in object-oriented language, there are two kinds of languages. They did two different things. So um, what? I imagine since the day one, I start doing object-oriented programming language. I thought that the protection of the private member of, an, uh, of a class or an object is object-based. So object-based means that if I declare something which is private, only this particular object instance can access that private member. Apparently, I don't know when, maybe started from all the way from the beginning, is that there are languages that this private member protection or the principal encapsulation is actually class-based, not object-based. So, so you know the difference. So the object-based means only this object can access the private member. But if it's class based, then basically all the members in the same class have access to private member on other object instance in the class, in the same class. Okay, so um, knowing this difference, uh, let me later explain why they make this difference. But first, let me tell you. Some object language, C++ or Java, they are class-based assets. So it means in either C++ or Java, I mean, depending on which version you're using, you, should, you better try it, just don't take my word for it. Um, you can actually access to, you can actually access to the, the, uh, the other, Object belongs to the same class you're in, their private member. But in other languages, like Ruby, for example, the access control is object based. It means that you can only access the private member of the same object, not even other objects in the same class. Is, is that, is that, uh, clear about what I was saying about whether the control, the access control of the private member is based on which object you're in or which class you're in. Okay, that, that's just the, the rule they make, they, they make by the language design. Okay, so then people start to talk about why C++ was doing uh, this type of uh, class-based control. So there are essentially two arguments and essentially one simple application. So I'll talk about one of the things. It means that when did this particular uh, feature is needed? When it means that when do you really need the class access to the, sorry, the class-based access control? It's really just copy construct. I mean, you can use it in other places, like we showed you uh, last time. I actually be able to access other member, sorry, other objects, private member from other member function. But people really like the feature because of the copy constructor. The concept of copy constructor is is very uh, 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 in copy constructor. You really want to have that in order for you to copy the object very quickly without going through define get accept each of the private members. Okay, that, that is that is a 
the strong, probably the unique, uh, inclusive application of this concept. Okay, so so now we talk about why they do this. They do this. They did this for two reasons. I, I kind of summarize. Uh, the first reason is easier for compiler to check. Well, if, if you want to provide for object access, they might have some worry about some other thing, like pointer, you do testing or, or other thing. But with if it is a class-based access control, then the compiler checking is actually easier. By the way, um, I think it's still possible for compiler check for object access. And I'm actually not going to talk about a deeper case such as inheritance. When you inherit, it means that uh, a, a child class, can you actually access the private network of a parent class? That we will delay until we talk about uh, inheritance. But the second reason they said, which is interesting, I buy that, but yet I am not completely sure I, I really appreciate that. The reason they said class space SS control should be good enough for encapsulation is because the class is designed by one person. It means that you should design the class yourself. And therefore you should allow, if there is any kind of bridges of encapsulation that you should actually work on your class as a module to prevent any kind of bad thing that happened because you allow object access. Sorry, you allow object, yeah, you allow object to access private member within the same class. So, so the thinking is modularity about a class design. So you actually will do that. Um, so they want to control under that. I mean, you can see that this is uh, some of the people uh, in the discussion, Stack Overflow, really feel that this messed up a lot of principal issues they have. Um, the second argument, some kind of push, they are already complicated, we have inheritance. But even within the class, without inheritance, uh, sometimes we know that you have programmers firm. Multiple programmers work on the same file. One left the company, the other one tried to understand what they're doing. And we still need to be careful when the, the class deposition is getting big. Okay, so, so just to let you know, I mean, this is my recommendation. If we ever want to write a program to access private member of other objects belong to the same class, if we ever want to do that, my recommendation is use only copy constructor and use only when you want to do initialization. And don't use otherwise because it might confuse a lot of situations. Okay. That's a that's a quick summary about a really, really nice uh, discussion we have, which is something I did about uh, last Friday. So I did some. Study over the years. Any any question? Do you remember what we talked about last Friday, or just weekend is too <laughs> too too joyful that we we forgot all the bad thing happened last week? Okay, all right, that's fine. All right, good. Yeah, that that's that's exciting as a as an instructor, as you can see that. Uh, did I tell you how many how many years I've been programming C++? Probably 30, 35 years, probably, 1987. The first C++, strictly the first C++ program I ever wrote is 1987. That's the first time I touched a C++ compiler. But the language come out uh, earlier, but I, that's the first time I used the language. And uh, yeah. I'm still learning. So will you. Yes. What 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 do you mean by first program? Oh. Not hello world. Not hello world. <laughs> okay. So 
That's a good question. I never remember how I why learn C++, but I can tell you a little bit about why I actually why I learned C++. Because my uh, C supervisor, she she was my she, Professor Gail Kaiser. She was both my master C supervisor and the PhD supervisor. So she developed a programming language from that NELP. Supposed to it's an operative principle and merging with another concept called data flow computing. And at that time, what we do with that? So we actually translate, write a compiler to translate this like her language to C. So essentially, how do we actually convert one language to the other? So you, you know, I have been doing this kind of converting language, one operator to the other one uh, since that time. So that's why um, I, I have to learn C to learn the difference and so on. It, this two language in syntactically they're similar, but it's totally different in semantics. That's why uh, I have to learn C++. And a bunch of other other the language. Yes, please. Right. Yeah. So that no, copy constructor is a way for us to copy the content initialize an object from the other object. So the, the counting the object is basically a static variable. It's a static variable for us to track something that related to this spot. So for example, how many objects that's. And, and let me just recast what, what we did last week. So with this static variable means that all objects within the same class they share this variable, one single variable. It's like a share variable, everybody. In fact, later you will realize it's not just every object within this class, but all the subclass, all the uh, child classes that inherit from this class will also share that. So inheritance, in fact, they think will happen. We will talk about that inheritance in chapter 13, I believe. It's, uh, C++ inheritance is going to be quite different from Java. So notice if you are a Java programmer, uh, the way C++ is defined in inheritance is quite unique. And it changes uh, all the time. So that's why uh, I'm not too happy about that. Yeah. So, so just, just tell you that for those of you who understand, um, from the Java programmer, you have the concept called single inheritance and multiple inheritance. And in C++, we have a three kinds of inheritance, single inheritance, multiple inheritance, virtual inheritance. And, and I really believe that if you can get your job done with the single inheritance, which is the simplest one, don't use any other option because other option, you will see that. I will actually push you to do the homework. It actually uh, give you a lot of surprise. When you, for example, virtual inheritance and multiple inheritance, they are uh, very different. When it looks like it is, they're the same, but they're very different. Okay, we'll, we'll see that in, when we talk about next chapter. All right, so now I want to go through the, finally, I. Got through that. Now I'm going to uh, chapter 12, which is called operator overloading. So let me actually tell you what uh, the, the operator overloading is really trying to do. Um, there are multiple ways I can present this material. But I want to present the material from my perspective. I feel this is the most important thing. So operator overloading is trying to improve the readability of your code. That to me is the only valid reason. There are other reasons people will. That's why I said, don't trust me always. You decide, you make your own judgment, but I present from my perspective. It's really try to improve the code readability. So which means that you need to understand what it is to make a better read, but also you need to understand how other people might misuse operator overloading. So let me actually use an example. Um, in the program box that I actually showed you last time, 
I actually changed one of the variable. There is a function, there is a member function called compare, like a volume or the size of this two box. Remember, we calculate the, the volume by actually find the length, width, and the height together. We got that number. So we actually find a function called uh, compare uh, two objects. I want to compare two objects. So let me actually just go back to the code. So you, you will remember what we are talking about. I mean, this is not exactly the same code, but it's a very similar. This is the, the, the program we have, and this code is called, oh, let me use box.h, that's fine. See, in box.h, we have a code called compare. This part, this part of code, let me actually make it a little bit bigger. This is one of the member function. Um, so what it does is that it's trying to compare this object with another object in terms of some of their properties. And in this case, you can see that what I did is inside this, I just basically uh, tried to compare the, oh, this is, this is actually the code I, I put it there last Friday, just to show how uh, the private variable can be accessed. But that, that line should be, should be uh, uh, get rid of. So you can see that it will basically compare, return a, a Boolean value, if the volume is actually smaller, it's going to return minus one. If it's equal, it's going to return zero. Otherwise, it's going to be one. So basically, when you do compare, it's give you whether it's a positive value, negative value, or zero. So it's basically doing a, a comparison about what value you're going to have. I mean, you can think about this compared to the slide. It's different function, but it's a similar in concept. that we have a piece of code between two box. Oh, by the way, that's actually from uh, EX1102. Uh, I put it here, that's nice. And under here, I try to compare two objects of the same class and for some property. Okay, I, I, I want to ask your opinion. How do you like this piece of code here? when I try to call it, right? I define a member function for compare and then I just do that. How, how do you like this piece of code? Do you think it's okay? I mean, if you feel it's okay, raise your hand. Some of you think it's okay, good. If you don't like this code, raise your hand. Oh. Okay, some of you don't like this code and the rest of you is okay, right? Just like, I mean, as long as the program works, why not get, right? Okay, so for those of you who don't like this code, please let, let us know why you don't like this code. Yes. I feel like it's doing the job a little bit, so I just like to do one and one. Okay, because you already know upper your overload, right? Okay, you're biased, so I, I, I cannot I, I cannot think of it. <laughs> If somebody who don't like the book and also they don't know operating on the loading. That's, we, we have a biased world here. Okay, so so this one is I, I'm saying that operator loading is for uh, readability. So I'm actually going to compare this two piece of code. So the first, I mean, they are actually doing the same thing. But I the, the bottom one, I'm actually using operator overloading. And the code will look like this. Do you think the second one might look better naturally from a, a, a programmer perspective? Because I know it's bigger than that, right? So that, that's operator overloading. So, so, okay, so you know what operator loading is trying to do. It's trying to make things look nicer, more readable. That's what I said. That's the reason. Now I'm going to see how we're going to do implement the syntax of operator overload.
Okay, I'm going to Yes, so here is the here is the way of defining operator. So the bottom one was the code I show you. The top one is actually the implementation. So I need to declare a member function, which I use the keyword operator, and then with a bigger sign. Operator with a bigger sign. And then I can actually start to uh, just take the same thing, right? Box, uh, a box, and then return bond is greater than a box double. Okay, I give you like a 10 seconds to look at both the new way of saying the operator greater than how they're gonna do between those two objects and also the syntax. This is a syntax, okay? This is under the class box that you define this part. Sorry, you define this part. Okay, any question? Yes. Okay. Um, yes. If you do a, I think this one you can you can try that. But sometimes uh, the language can force you to use m percent. Um, M percent always confuses. Let me actually say another thing. For copy constructor, you have to use M percent because that's the difference between M percent and no M percent is whether it's counted as a reference. It's almost like a pointer, but C plus plus has this concept called reference. M percent means it's a reference. Reference means that um, if anything that's actually changed its value, that inside it will see the changes. But on the other hand, that you have a cost. So essentially you prevent people changing. It. But you will see if there is other piece of code actually be able to change that, you will be able to see that. That's the reason that the reference, let me just say that. In copy constructor, you have to have reference because copy constructor, because whenever you don't use M percent, it's called by value. I mean, you probably know the difference between call by value and call by reference. I just repeat them. Call by value means that I make a copy of the value, pass it to the function. Call by reference means I directly pass the reference into that function I'm calling. So, copy constructor, you have to do call by, and you have to do reference because, because when I want to copy a value, I have to call copy constructor. So, so, so in copy constructor, I have to use M percent. But this function, my guess is that you can actually remove M percent. It, it might still work. It's still, you just invoke extra copy. It might, the code might be slow. Okay, so this is just, uh, uh, does that answer your question? Okay. <clears throat> All right, so take a look at this code. Um, do you like the, the way it's defined? And its usage. Okay, good. I will I will tell you what uh, the potential problem is. Okay. So oper operator overloading, you can pretty much overload everything. I mean, the example I show you is greater than, but you can actually overload everything except a few operators. And you cannot overload the meaning of those operators. I mean, you wouldn't even think about to overload. For example, uh, star is, is like if you reference something, you don't want to overload that. And then you don't want to overload, say, size of or some other uh, if then else. This is like a if then else kind of uh, statement. So essentially, you can overload pretty much every, every operator that the language has, uh, such as. You can actually, you can think about it, you can even overload the array index. 
that's actually pretty interesting. You can do a lot of things with, with array. What deal with that? Okay. Readability, I don't know. But let me actually tell you why I want to. I want to actually be careful about operator overload. If you see the operator overloading the box compared to the two box, yeah, you have a question. Overloading means that I actually have, um, okay, overloading and operator overloading is a little bit different, okay? Overloading means that it's the same function name, that this function name actually has a different, uh, different uh, variety of functions. Depending on your function signature, you can call one of those functions. So operator overloading means that I have an operator, and this operator might have also different functions depending on what is the variable, the type, the variable function signature is the call different one. N percent, N percent is the record. Yes, you can overload that. It's a different, I mean, anything you can overload. Yeah. So let, let me actually take a differently is that instead of just doing this operator as it is, say you compare two integer, it's greater than. But I can actually overload that in such that when you have compared two objects, by the way, operator overloading is only possible within the definition of a class. It means that you operate as at least the left argument has to be an object. The right argument could be anything, but the left argument of the operator must be uh, must be a, a uh, how do I say that? Must be an object of some type. Okay. Does that answer your question? I know this, if, if you never touch the idea of overloading, this might all operate overloading, this might be a little bit confused. I want to go a little bit slower. So let, let me actually just go back to check. You understand this piece? So I want to make sure everybody feel comfortable on this slide. This slide basically show how you define a operator greater than Overload that definition and such that I will actually provide function implementation such that I can actually do something I want within that function. And then this is the way how to use that. It looks like you're just comparing two integer or two floating points, but it's not. It's actually comparing two objects. And because of operator overloading, it redirects that comparison to a function. It's no longer just the operator, but really invoking a function and then doing things and return the value as the return of this statement, box one, written box two. So the other way I want to go slow is that we return value, whatever in the operator overloading as I define operator greater than, the return value will replace that statement of box one greater than box two in a long time. Does that make sense? That, that's the that's idea of operating Yes. 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 If, if the operator, that's why sometimes it, it might improve your readability, but it might not. It actually might confuse people 
because in this case, bot is very simple. There's the only thing I can compare in a bot is pretty much just the volume. So I can do operator overload. But let me just, just thing is that um, it's really for code readability, but sometimes really confusing. Let me give you an example. I like to give people this example. Um, yeah, I want to give you a warning that I, I don't actually sometimes don't like to use operator, operator overloading unless you really understand the code, what they're comparing. So the, the issue is this, I compare two boxes, I know what I did. But how about I actually overloading compare two person? I define a black person to compare two person, person one and person two. And I mean, there are so many things you can compare between two person. And, and therefore, unless you strictly understand what you're comparing, you're comparing ages, you're comparing uh, the number of game points somebody made each month, or you compare some other measurable stuff within the person object, that this code might be really confusing unless you really understand the code like this. I mean, essentially this break this break encapsulation because you actually need to understand that particular piece of code in order for you to understand what that comparison really means. Um, so that's why I said if, if, it's, if it's improved help, readability, use it. Simple case, use it. But don't use it when you can because it's confusing sometimes. Yes. Uh, okay, so when I call it, right? Okay, so I have a box one and box two, right? When I compare that. So when you translate to that operator, the box one is actually the object. That's actually both the vessel. And box two on the right is the argument. So a box, in this case, a box, that variable you, you refer to is box two. So, so just to let you know that syntactically, this is what I call the left argument of the operator is the one who is actually being, being called. Because that, you see that message, it must be, it must be called from some object instance. So let me actually go back to the original code that I asked you to compare. This is the original code that we're talking about. You see, I, I don't use object, I don't use operator overloading. It will be box one, which is the object instance dot compare volume, which is the, the comparison function I really want to do. And then box two is the parameter for that function. So now I'm actually changing the word compare volume to operator for today. And then I can use the operator overloading. And that's the kind of convenient to make the code. And I do want to say operator overloading is something which is uh, quite useful. You can actually use it at time, but uh, just be careful. Yes. Yes, you can do that as well. Yeah. In fact, that might be a good idea because it's it's really putting another entity to put this two objects we are comparing their equal position. But but you can see that right now these two are not equal because the left hand dominant. Yeah. Okay, that's a good point. Yes. I tend to agree with you that some of us actually found 
the first one may be not as, how do I say that, as uh, uh, fancy looking like the second way, but it actually communicate information unambiguously. So, so that's why you, you might, uh, yeah, it's, it's actually a debatable question, in fact. That's why I asked you the first question, which way you prefer? The first way or the second way? I mean, you will be working with the team of other programmers to share the code. I guess this is a, this will be the decision that you and your team will decide. Yes, on the back. Yes, that's true. Yeah, you can read that. Yeah, because box one greater than box two doesn't say anything about the box, right? They just say, assuming everybody, it's kind of arrogant, right? You assume everybody knows that that, that must be uh, 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 a, a particular measure that everybody on the team or everybody uses this option. Okay, so, um, you, you will see some example, but part of this uh, issue, I, I do want to tell you that a lot of time we learn this concept, it's not because we want to use it, it's simply because other people might use it. And in fact, some of the people I have seen, they kind of um, a bit abuse the language feature in the way their program really looks like they're writing a C program. Because in C program, you see this a lot. I mean, can somebody tell me that this in C program, usually if you see this, uh, the meaning is you're comparing like a two uh, reference or pointer or something like that. Okay, it's, it's um, yeah, be careful. All right. I just want to, let me move this way. So I, I, I mentioned that this is, this is actually pretty, um, difficult when you have a different kind of person. But the other thing I do want to mention is that um, in operator overloading, to make it more tricky is that because you have two objects, and I said the first object is the object being both operator, and the second object is actually a parameter. Because it's a parameter, it might have a different type. Some of this might be person. But some of them later you learn about inheritance, maybe a, a, a teacher or a student, which is a subclass from the class person. And because this type change, it might actually involve a different operator overloading, a different version of this point of end. So just be careful that. Um, even a single operator, you can have multiple functions depending on the type, the data type of the second argument we put in here. Okay. Okay. So um, I I think I will wrap up uh, this way. So operator overloading, I'm, I'm teaching you the the simplest one, and uh, I think that that will be uh, enough for today. But I want to just summarize that um, I want to emphasize number one, why is operator overloading, how it can be done. And number three is basically you have to really, really be careful not using it because you can use it, okay? Okay, I'm going to stop here because then I'm going to uh, start another big topic after this. All right, see you on Wednesday. By the way, uh, I just want to make a quick announcement for today's discussion hour. Uh, this afternoon, I will be there. Um, I will update homework, uh, any kind of homework situation, and also probably just be there to answer all your questions about, about this class. Okay.